So we analyzed our one-dimensional collision where we had an object one moving with some initial velocity, object two also moving with some initial velocity. And after the collision, we just arbitrarily said object one is moving this way and object two was moving that way and we called that our I hat direction. In this collision, we assumed that it was a frictionless surface and there were no external forces, so momentum was constant. Now, what about energy? Well, we know that if there's external force, if there's no external forces, then in principle, there could be no uh, external work. However, during the collision, we've established different types of collisions. We said elastic collision is when we are assuming that the kinetic energy of the system, that's K system final minus K system initial, is zero. The statement that the kinetic energy is constant. We have an inelastic collision in which delta K system has decreased and that can come from some deformation of the objects during the collision heat is generated, some sound, some other source of energy in which is energy is always constant, but the kinetic energy of the system could diminish. And we also talked about a super elastic collision. And in this type of collision, the kinetic energy of the system has increased. Now, that's a little bit tricky in terms of what we're calling our system. But imagine that when these two objects collided, there were some type of chemicals on it that exploded. And so that there was some chemical energy that was converted into excessive kine extra kinetic energy. So in order to make a model of our problem, we have to beforehand make some assumptions about the nature of the collision. Now, for our particular collision, let's assume that the collision is elastic. So we have two conservation principles. We have that the kinetic energy of the system is constant, and we've already said that because there's no external forces, the momentum of the system is constant. So now we can write down our kinetic energy condition. We have M1, V1. Now here, this can be a little bit tricky how we're going to write this, because remember, kinetic energy is a magnitude squared plus 1 half M2 V2 initial squared equals 1 half M1 V1 final squared plus 1 half M2 V2 final squared. Now, because a component, although it can be positive or negative, in one dimension, if you square the component, you get the magnitude. So I can also write this equation, and I'm going to divide through by the halves, all, cancel all those, as 1 x initial squared equal to the magnitude squared plus m2 v2 x initial squared equals m1 v1 x final squared plus 1 half m2 v2 x final squared. And we've already canceled all the halves, so we have no half there. Now, given this equation, um, we'll call this equation one. We can also have our momentum equation, which I'm going to write down as two, m1 vx initial plus m2 v2x initial equals m1 v1 x final plus m2 v2 x final, reminding us of our condition of the constancy of momentum. So now if you look at this, if we're given the masses, all the mi's, and we're also given the initial state of the system, v2 x initial, then we have two equations and two unknowns and we can solve algebraically for v1 x final and v2 x final. And by determining the, out the signs of these components, we can figure out 
the actual final state of the system. So this is going to end up involving a quadratic equation. 